Hello everybody, welcome again to another Artist Dream Games interview. Today we're sitting down with Sin, the lead artist of Kit Fox Games. Sin, how are you doing today? Good, good. Hello everyone. Let's get started. As lead artist for Kit Fox Games, what are your primary responsibilities for the team? Well, lead artist and also art director. So I, I try to find a unique visual direction for each of our projects, and I do most of the production work as well. Uh, just basically the, I'll draw in the characters, animating them, and also the interface, the user interface stuff, some, some graphic design. I make the website, and I do the trailers too. Very, very nice. You're a man with many, many hats. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. How Variety is the spice of life, they say. Yes. Which brings me to my next question. How do you handle producing all the 2D assets when most games have a team of artists? Do you ever sleep, sir? Have you drained the coffee machine dry? Oh, well, I try to find the laziest and cheapest solution whenever possible. So it's fastest, right? right. And, uh... Right now, it's it's a bit of it's quite a bit of work. I have to admit, I'm also teaching on the side, so oh, nice. My schedule is pretty packed. Mm. Yeah, but definitely finding a good workflow and pipeline helps uh, which makes things faster. With Shard Plant, you went with a more Bastion style. This time with Moon mm -hmm. Hunters, you're going more pixel style. Was that actually a pragmatic choice to make things flow better, make it easier to produce it, or was it more a stylistic choice? I think it's both. Definitely both. With Shadow Planet, we realized that having this sort of the puppet animation, especially with the painted uh, aesthetic, the Bastion aesthetic, animating that in 2D uh, and having like nice, juicy animation for an action RPG game would take a lot of effort or just a lot of time that we don't really have. So definitely uh, having a downsize in it to more minimalistic pixel art style, was, was it would be a smart move. So better workflow, right? All right, you cite Ultraman as a significant influence on the kit box. <laughs> How has that impacted your art, and what other major influences do you draw upon when you're producing all the art of kit box? Yeah, I think that's like half comical, but it's true. Like uh, growing up, I, I was watching the old '70s, '80s original Ultraman TV series, so. Like, I always loved having, you know, those, I had those kaiju toys and I had books on, on, on Ultraman. And I think that's, just, like, subconsciously it's built up sort of this visual library for, for me to, that inspires me and just games later on. For Moon Hunters, we're looking at fantasy illustrators, but with a style that's a bit more different, a bit weirder. So not something that's more mainstream fantasy stuff that you see with Blizzard, for example, or it's yeah. more comic book, exaggerated, cartoony style. We're going for more of a dark fantasy. So I'm looking at, for example, Mobius, Wayne Barlow, and Amano, of course, Yoshitaka uh, Amano, for the, the illustrator for the earlier Final Fantasy games, right? And those three guys, each have their own personal style and just in terms of the, the visual shape language in, in the illustrations, it's, there's, there's stuff in there that's different from what we see these days. Indeed, indeed. I'm looking at the actual concepts you've drawn up for some of the characters. It's so visually different from what you normally see, and it looks great. It looks like something you can't Thanks. find anywhere else. Yeah, definitely in terms of the time period, we're inspired by ancient Assyria. Instead of European uh, Middle Ages, right? So that I think that helps bring a, a different uh, feel to it as well. Indeed, indeed. I particularly love the um, that one skull building you have. It's cycling through the slideshow, so that one keeps popping up. It looks so distinctive. That was one of the ones you live streamed, correct? Yeah, it was the first one. Oh. One of the first ones. I just wanted to do something really, really weird with the building. It looks uh, awesome. I, yeah, I, I'm kind of thinking about how we can, you know, put that, translate that into pixel art and how you would explore that area. It gets kind of tricky with uh, structures that are pretty vertical, especially because of the top-down view, mm -hmm. because uh, you don't really want a player to go behind it, because yeah. it obscures their view. So, yeah, there's some technical limitations there, but, yeah, it makes it interesting. How does it feel, actually, to be doing the live stream, to actually show the art process to fans and viewers? Did that help lead you towards a teaching idea? Was that just it? You wanted to show the process of making the art? We we wanted just to, you know, show the, the process to our fans, to the viewers. And 
and yeah, you know, it's it's a fun thing to watch. And also, I mean, a lot of people they tune in and listen to music and ch- check in from time to time. And yeah, for me, it actually kind of helps my my productivity up a little bit because I can't go check Facebook when I'm live streaming, for example. Uh, so there's that benefit. And uh, I'm pretty comfortable at this point with uh, just doing work and having people looking at it. Uh, I think definitely I started teaching last December, and just that experience has helped has helped me um, with, with that. Because a lot for a lot of artists, um, their art is a very personal thing, yeah. and you know some of us we, we're kind of shy about showing our stuff. Like I w- usually wouldn't uh, draw or sketch in public, you know, but. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable with it now. What is it like creating assets for a game that has procedural generation? Because you have to predict for all these different permutations, all these different ways of working it, just like how Minecraft has certain specific blocks for caverns and stuff like that that it has to randomize. You have to make that all by hand. How, how does that work? For Are you talking about more for Shadow Planet or Moon Hunters? Or both? Know more about for Moon Hunters here. Moon Hunters, okay. Uh, Moon Hunters, we're actually building a lot of levels uh, by hand. Oh. So it, it's more of a puzzle piece procedural generation where we kind of attach different map sections together. Um, it's still in the works, but uh, I think we're going to have more control over the, the level design that, that way. And, you know, I can make better artistic decision that way and uh, level design decision that way for, for Tanya, too. Um but there are some things that I have to think about, you know, have to always try to make things more modular and reusable. Mm-hmm. For example, the uh, the ground, um, we're using sort of these big chunks of tiled textures, 256 by 256 pixel, and we will tie them together. I mean, in classical pixel art or JRPGs, it's sort of a smaller tile set system mm-hmm. where you have small 16 by 16 pixel tiles that you would have different variation and lay them now together but again to save time and just make it make the game look more painterly and not so um not have too many visible patterns in the ground i opted for these giant chunks like it fills up pretty much half the screen or three quarters of the screen and and um and then we can tile them as well so it's modular and yet has a you know has a more more organic feeling to it than an actual tile set. So it's a quasi state. You can make it be these predefined chunks, but you can also mm-hmm. make it go more procedurally generated when you need to. Very nice. Yeah, we're thinking of many like different options for that. Like we could probably change the. Um, we can set different a specific spawn point for a landmark, but the landmark could be uh, I don't know, like a fountain or a giant house, a giant tree, or something. I just have to make sure that the assets that I create looks good no matter what on that type of ground in that environment so the colors are match and all that how many iterations do you usually have to go through for something like that when you're trying to get a big landmark that can work in several different scenarios mm, um, I definitely start by looking at pictures that that's super helpful I think because um, you know I only have memorized so many shapes in my head that looking at pictures is always a good start and I kind of distill that uh, designing the picture into my pixel art and I will probably for a landmark I'll probably have to spend somewhere between two to four hours to have something okay going on and might need some tweaking later on but yeah uh, generally I would probably talk with Tanya a bit to get a, 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 an idea of what the landmark could be and from there I'll just start going to Photoshop and just start uh, sketching roughly sketching some pixel art stuff and then spend a couple of hours refining it once I once I like the, the shape of it. Yeah, you actually showed that in um, one of your recent art updates. You were showing the uh, different structures for a building. At one point it had this curved exterior. Now it's got a different wall that has that curve still in it, but it's in the wall instead of being out there. Yeah. And, yeah, it's kind of fun to, to mix and match that way, too. Uh, like, for some of the villagers, I started just building one house and then I start, you know, selection part, selecting part of it and copy and pasting it around and then almost like collaging it because uh, it's a good way to have a coherent architecture and coherent arts direction that way because you're repeating um, the same visual elements several times and that reinforces that aesthetic and it also makes it faster to create several 
different assets based off just one single one. What advice would you give for all those budding artists out there who do want to produce content for games? Mm, definitely, I think it's... What, what I'm interested in seeing when I'm looking at portfolios is um, I'm, I want to see your thought process, how creative you are. Um, I want to see variations based on the same subject, right? It's, it's great that you can paint, you know, uh, can draw or paint something really pretty, but what I really want to see is that how you can adapt that for different situations. Like, if, you, if you've got this character, what if I want a, a heavier melee version of this character? How about a sniper version? And, you know, can you make all these characters fit in the same visual universe, right? And can you show me something that's different, like a steampunk meets science? I don't know. Like, I'm looking for visual languages and just visuals that, 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 would, that I can use for a game that will make the game look unique, right? Because a lot of people can draw and paint the, gen the generic demon, the muscle guy, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is your favorite part of Moon Hunters? Mm, I think right now I really want I really love seeing the whole environment and world coming together. So the world building is something that kind of really excites me. Um, just thinking about little things that will make the world feel more alive, like working on birds and making the, the herbs and the, the little foliage wobble when you walk by them. Having those details just make those little gems that you, that you kind of put a bit everywhere in the game to make it just feel nice and alive for, for uh, exploring. That's a good little bit of movement, even if you're just standing still. Yeah, little, little wind. We actually have a... Um, sort of a wind system where it's just a giant uh, rectangle that moves across the map and triggers animations as it goes through. So the trees, it would move, but, you know, as, as a wave. <laughs> that, that's fantastic. Most, most devs wouldn't think of that. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, it's simple to implement, too, so it was, like, kudos to, to Mike for, for that idea. It's great. <laughs> kudos to him very much for that. All right. At um, this part in the interview, we've got a little time left, so you can ask me or my audience a question. Any question you want. Mm, what do you guys want to see most in Moon Hunters? Personally, for me, I'm really curious to see the myth system. Because I was talking with Tanya about that, and just... Mm -hmm. I kind of want to see how that impacts the world. And I hear that you're that there's going to be custom constellations for all the characters. How are you actually handling that? Uh, right now, I think I'm just going to draw a bunch of constellations. It doesn't take a lot of time to, to draw a constellation. I basically just have to sketch out something and then place points, dots across in pixel art and then link them together. <laughs> Instead of trying to draw stars, link them together, and then figure out what it looks like, right? Yeah. And so I can really just spend, you know, two or three days and we can have 20, 30, 40 different constellations that Tanya can use and for, for her storytelling system, her mythology system. Um, but I think the heavier part of that is, like, say, if one of your actions affects a village and the village ends up being destroyed, that's more work for me. That, that means I have to um, go back to that village and make a, like a destroyed version of it. But I think that's going to add a lot to the game. The, you know, the, the world's visually changing a lot based on your actions. There you, there you go. That's what you were saying. You need to have a lot of variation for it. So, yeah, <laughs> you can't just say I made a pretty building. It's like okay, now demolish it and make it look like it's been going through hell. Yeah, yeah. and I think what would be cool, for example, I just I have a lot of ideas of how I can make it look a bit different. For example, maybe the desert village. Um, there's one quest where maybe you can find a tree of life and then you can plant seeds around the buildings, and then the whole village becomes more of a flower desert village instead of just the desert village. You know, stuff like that would be really, really cool. Yeah. All right. Well, you have a good day, Sin. It was great sitting down to talk with you. Hey, my pleasure, man. Have a great day, too. For those of you watching, if you want to see Sin's live streams, he regularly does them weekly. We'll be including a link to the channel where he streams below and the time. And for all more things artistic, please be sure to check up Artistry and Games.